Taoism is a very rich philosophical and religious tradition. It has been a huge factor in the Chinese history and also lately in the more Western world. The most famous Taoist text, the Tao Te Ching, written by the probably mythical author Lao Tzu, is a very popular and influential text today, just as it was 2000 years ago. I have already dedicated a full video to exploring Taoism and the early Taoist authors, to be exact, but in this video I want to be a bit more specific and focus in on one of those most significant figures and texts. Not the more famous Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching, but another one of the most famous and influential uh, figures and texts in Taoism, the ever-fascinating Zhuang Tzu. <laughs> This video is brought to you and sponsored by my wonderful patrons, a few new ones of which have appeared in the last few weeks, and I'm gonna uh, name them now. Um, I would like to thank Ashfaq Es Mehdi, uh, Vegan Panos Panosian, uh, Awes Sheikh, Dan Hill, Be Not Afraid, Asim Mutainai, uh, Mahmoud Abdullah, Salman Al Najim, M. Akmal Makhtoum, Awais Mahmoud Tariq, Yeshua Dalvin, Tanvir Sian, Abdullah Khudadad, Sean Mosby, Amr Hegazi, Sayyid Jafari, and Amu Latif. Thank you so much, and again, thank you to all of my patrons and supporters. I will leave a link to my patron page in the description for anyone who wants to join our patron community. Aside from the Tao Te Ching, the text known as the Zhuan Tzu is probably the most important and influential book in all of Taoism. It is named after its author, who thus is also named Zhuan Tzu. Well, his actual name was actually Zhuang Zhou, Zhuang Zhe meaning literally Master Zhuang. We don't know a whole lot about his life, though. He probably lived between the 4th to 3rd centuries BCE, during the so-called Warring States period in Chinese history. Some scholars have suggested the dates of circa 369 to 286 BCE for his life, but it's all very uncertain. Unlike Lao Tzu, however, Master Zhuan was probably a real historical person, and at least part of the text named after him was most likely his own composition. As I said, he was born during the very tumultuous Warring States period, after the fall of the Western Zhou Empire, but before the unification of China under the later Qin Dynasty. A very chaotic and divided time indeed, but one that produced a whole lot of different philosophical schools and movements that would survive for a very long time afterwards. It is indeed during this period that Confucius presents his philosophical ideas of very strong ritualism and filial piety, further also developed by his student Mencius, and which would become the, perhaps the most influential school of thought and philosophy in Chinese history. It is also this period that brought Confucius' opponent, Mozi, who instead argued that Confucius' strong emphasis on rituals and ceremonies was a useless waste of resources, and instead favored the idea of an all-inclusive love of all human beings, and a concern for their material uh, benefit, and, and their the rule under a kind of anthropomorphic god. Likewise, it is this period that brought us the earliest Taoist authors and philosophers, including Zhuang Tzu, or Master Zhuang. He is a very obscure personality whose life remains much of a mystery to us, but we do get some very basic information in a brief biography by a Sima Qian, where he tells us that Zhuang Tzu was a native of Meng in the state of Song, which is present-day Henan province. This biography also states that Zhuang Tzu at some point in his life served as a minor official, but other than this, he seems like a very obscure personality, one who often seems to indeed laugh in the face of any authority and any claims to knowledge, really. From his own writings and from this biography partly, we do get the image of a rather ascetic individual, of a kind of wise madman who would wander around and challenge people's assumptions about things. Not unlike the Socrates of ancient Greece, or indeed of 
Yoda in the Star Wars films. In one story, it is said that Dronce was invited by a king to serve as prime minister, to which Dronce just laughed in his face and said, quote, A thousand measures of gold is substantial profit, and prime ministership is an exalted position indeed. But haven't you ever heard about the ox offered in the official sacrifice? He is generously fed for years and dressed in the finest embroidered fabrics so that he may one day be led into the great temple for slaughter. When that day comes, though he may wish that he were just a little orphan piglet instead, it is too late. So scram you, do not defile me. I'd rather enjoy myself wallowing in the filth than let myself be controlled by some head of state. Whether this is a true story or not is, of course, very hard to say, but if any of you have actually read the Dronza, you'll have to agree that this certainly fits with his wider personality and tone. But our main interest regarding this man is not so much his obscure biography or life, but rather the text that he left behind. An incredibly influential text that has left its mark on the following generations. Named after its author, the Dronze is a profoundly engaging, funny, and baffling piece of work. It shares many themes and concepts with the other Taoist classic, the Tao Te Ching, but often expresses them in, so say, rougher and very different ways, as well as also introducing a lot of new, very profound and striking imagery and, and ideas. Now, when we talk about the Dronze as a book, we are usually referring to 33 separate chapters or sections which have traditionally been uh, compiled or are considered to be one single volume and named the Dronze. Now today we have a bit of a different view of this. The first seven chapters of the book are usually referred to as the inner chapters and this section is usually considered to be the work of Master Dron himself. It has a somewhat coherent style and its ideas seem to be consistent. But the remaining chapters, numbers 8 to 22 being called the outer chapters and the remaining 23 to 33, the miscellaneous chapters, were, according to most scholars today, not written by Dronze himself, but rather by other later Taoist authors who were inspired by him or perhaps by his disciples and probably within a range of about 150 years after his death. But they can all still be said to kind of represent the general themes and, and style of the, this wider work. But what does this text say? Well, to put it simply, it is an expression of that school of thought or philosophy that we would later come to call Taoism. Now, if you want a more thorough introduction and run through of the core ideas and concepts and teachings of Taoism, I suggest you watch my previous video on that subject. But in brief terms, Taoism proposes that there is an essential principle called the Tao, meaning way or path, which is at the center of all existence. The Tao is the way and flow of nature and of the universe. It is a principle that cannot be understood or articulated. Uh, it is sometimes conceived of as a oneness that encapsulates all things and hides beneath an appearance of multiplicity. To the Taoist, the goal of life is to live according to the way of the Tao, the way of the way, so to say, by the practice of Wu Wei, which means effortless action or inaction. Or in other words, to neglect our individual wills or selves and to live spontaneously according to the Tao and its natural flow. There are many different books of Taoism, like the Tao Te Ching and the Lietze, but the Zhuangzi in particular is so fascinating because the, it's so baffling and so eclectic in its language and its imagery. The text is sometimes almost completely indecipherable, at other times it is profoundly intellectually engaged Engaging, and at other times it's hilarious in its very humorous and comedic uh, stories. But most of the time it is all of these things at the same time, which is again what makes it so interesting to read. In the words of Brooks Zipporin, quote, it is precisely Dronce's humor that is beautiful, his beauty that is profound, and his profundity that is comic. 
One of the core features or ideas of the Zhuangzi is his very skeptical attitude towards knowledge or certainty. In many sections, he expresses the impossibility of reaching certainty on any matter, preferring instead to not ask any questions, but to just remain quiet. He even affirms that what he is saying is ultimately a compromise because words can never represent reality. In a very famous section, John Tzu tells of a dream he had, where in the dream he was a butterfly. But after waking up from this dream, he finds himself in confusion. Quote, Suddenly he awoke, and there he was, the startled John Joe in the flesh. He did not know if Joe had been dreaming he was a butterfly, or if a butterfly was now dreaming it was Joe. Another famous section which expresses similar tendencies is when Zhuangzi is walking with a friend called Huizi and sees a group of fish in a pond. Quote, Zhuangzi and Huizi were strolling along the bridge of the Hao River. Zhuangzi said, The minnows swim about so freely, following the openings wherever they take them. Such is the happiness of fish. Huizi said, You are not a fish, so whence do you know the happiness of fish? Zhuangzi said, well, you are not I, so whence do you know I don't know the happiness of fish? Huizi said, I am not you, to be sure, so I don't know what it is to be you. But by the same token, since you are certainly not a fish, my point about your inability to know the happiness of fish stands intact. Zhuangzi said, let's go back to the starting point. You said, whence do you know the happiness of fish? Since your question was premised on your knowing that I know it, I must have known it from up here, up above the Hao River. What Dronce is doing here is in a way responding to the philosophers who came before him, like Confucius and Mozi. All of these philosophers had claimed a Tao or way of their own. The word Tao at this time was used in various ways, but, part, but partly as a way of denoting a certain, you could say, school of thought or a way to truth or to structure society. So all of the philosophers, like again Confucius and Mozi, had their own Tao, their own truth or their own way to truth. Zhuangzi and the other Taoist authors are responding to this by basically turning the idea of the Tao on its head. They ironically instead turn it into something that is completely free of rules and guidelines. In other words, the very opposite of the traditional meaning of the word Tao. Tao is instead this ineffable thing that indeed is the truth, but a truth that is indescribable, beyond comprehension, and yet at the core of all being. In another comical yet profound section, quote, This is also that. That is also this. That posits a this and a that, a right and a wrong, of its own. But this also posits a this and a that, a right and a wrong, of its own. So is there really any that versus this, any right versus wrong, or is there really no that versus this? When this and that, right and wrong, are no longer coupled as opposites, that is called the course or Tao as axis, the axis of all courses. What Dronsu is doing here is collapsing the distinction between right and wrong, which creates what at least appears at first glance like a kind of moral nihilism. But what is also hiding here is a very profound statement about the nature of the Tao and of reality at large. To him, the Tao is one, and yet it is the essence of everything that is. Everything is the Tao, in a sense. And so, by that logic, everything is one. And this is, in fact, one of the, again, one of the main themes that recur in this text, uh, is the idea or the, the statement that everything is one. Thus, all multiplicity, or apparent multiplicity in the world, only come about through false association. When two people have an argument, say Confucius and Mozi, one person believes that he is right and that the other person is wrong. But to Zhuangzi, none of them is right, and both of them are also right at the same time. In reality, neither of them even exist as individuals, but only as different expressions of the one Tao. So, when the difference between me and you, or this and that, to use his own words, when, when these distinctions are destroyed, there is no longer any room for right or wrong. Instead, the only thing remaining is the Tao, which is, expresses itself in different tones and in different melodies. Now, this idea of the underlying oneness of the Tao and thus of the world is expressed very beautifully in one of the opening sections of this book. 
Here the Tao is described as the wind, which blows here and there. And when this wind travels through different holes, holes of different sizes and shapes, it makes various sounds, as the wind does. The shape and the size of the hole is what determines the sound the wind makes. And these sounds thus can be said to be all of the 10,000 things existing in the universe, as the Taoist expresses it. In other words, this means you and me and everything else in existence. It is in fact the emptiness of the holes which makes them distinct and creates the sound, but at the same time, everything is really just the wind itself, which expresses itself in different melodies, again. Quote, a light breeze brings a small harmony, while a powerful gale makes for a harmony vast and grand. And once the sharp wind has passed, all the holes return to their silent emptiness. But this is just the tip of the iceberg of what Tronso has to offer us. There are tons of different stories in the Tronso, which are often very humorous, but also expresses and, and some of the, the, the main points and ideas of his philosophical thought. He advises us to live according to the Tao, which means to not be attached to things in the world, to be detached from our own selves, our ego, and from the happenings, the things that happen to us and that happen in the world generally. This means to not even be attached to knowledge of any kind, because any knowledge will be based on uh, well, language and concept, and language can never express reality as it actually is. There are many sections where the idea of attachment or, or detachment are expressed in, in some of these various stories. In one section, for example, from the outer chapters, it is told how Drons' wife died and his friend, uh, again Huizu, came to visit him to give his condolences. But as he approaches Dronzo, he finds him sitting, seemingly very happy, banging on a drum. Huizi is shocked by this and asks, quote, You lived with her. She brought up your children and grew old, said Huizi. It should be enough simply not to weep at her death, but pounding on a tub and singing, this is going too far, isn't it? So Dronzo drops this bomb. Quote, You're wrong. When she first died, do you think I didn't grieve like anyone else? But I looked back to her beginning and the time before she was born. Not only the time before she was born, but the time before she had a body. Not only the time before she had a body, but the time before she had a spirit. In the midst of the jumble of wonder and mystery, a change took place and she had a spirit. Another change and she had a body. Another change and she was born. Now there has been another change and she's dead. It's just like the progression of the four seasons. Spring, summer fall, winter. Now she's going to lie down peacefully in a vast room. If I were to follow after her bawling and sobbing, it would show that I don't understand anything about fate. So I stopped. Life and death is a natural part of life. It is the way of the Tao. Death is not the end of anything, just as birth is not the beginning. It is all just a part of the constant change and transformation that is taking place in the universe. This is, of course, similar to the Buddhist idea of impermanence, and it would be foolish to attach ourselves to things that are perpetually changing and which are impermanent. A similar sentiment is expressed over Johnson's own death in another section, and I think I'll just quote you the whole thing here. Quote, Johnson was dying, and his disciples wanted to give him a lavish funeral. Johnson said to them, I will have heaven and earth as my coffin and crypt, the sun and moon for my pair of jades, the stars and constellations for my round oblong gems, all creatures for my tomb gifts and pallbearers. My funeral accoutrements are already fully prepared. What could possibly be added? But we fear the crows and vultures will eat you, master, said they. Dronce said, above ground I'll be eaten by crows and vultures, below ground by ants and crickets. Now you want to rob the one to feed the other. Why such favoritism? How can you not love this guy? And this is indeed a recurring theme in the book, to detach from the world and our limited self and see the world and the universe from the bigger picture. In the grand scheme of things, the death of Johnson's wife is only one transformation, just one more thing that changes in this, uh, this flowing, this unfolding of, of creation or this unfolding of the Tao and its flow. It's just another expression of the Tao doing its natural thing.
But also notice how John says that when initially when his wife died, he did weep like any sane person would. So he's not denying the legitimacy of human emotions. Um, it's a bit more nuanced than that, of course. But this means that he advocates a simple life, one free of association with things like rulers or scholars, but in complete spontaneity, flowing like water or riding the wind of the Tao. In another famous and humorous story, Dronza tells of a man who runs into this very big and ugly tree. Um, he looks at this tree and he sees that the branches are all twisted, um, the, the, the trunk of the tree is, is, is cut or it's, it's just a bad tree that cannot be used to build anything, not a coffin, no table, nothing at all, and so the man deems this tree to be useless. But then the story turns around, or it's turned basically on its head, when the author claims that it's, it, it's because the tree is ugly and, and useless that it has survived for so long. Because think about the other trees, the good trees, the beautiful, the fine trees. All of those trees have been cut down to be used to build various things. But because this tree was so ugly, no one has cut it down, and thus it has survived much longer than all the other trees. Quote, this is the trouble that comes from being worth something. In the expiation ceremony, cows with white spots, pigs with upturned snouts, and humans with hemorrhoids are considered unfit to be offered as sacrifices to the river god. All shamans know this, and thus they regard these creatures as a being of bad fortune. But this is exactly why the spirit man regards them as creatures of very good fortune indeed. These are all humorous quotes, of course, but what they are saying applies to human beings as well. It is better to be ugly and undesirable. It is better to not try to be pretty or virtuous or knowledgeable, because it is those people who get used and who are ultimately confused. It is through not being virtuous or not trying to be virtuous that true virtue is achieved. It is through uselessness that one becomes truly useful. Again, Dronza asks us to go beyond the illusory world of appearances, of multiplicity and things like status and fame. The scholars who try to figure out the truth only get lost in the ego of their own languages. By trying to grasp the truth with words, they are only straying further away from it. This is why he used so many paradoxes and humorous stories and parables to point out the uselessness of trying to articulate things in that way. Everything is fundamentally one and is always changing according to the flow of the Tao, and the true sage lives and acts accordingly. As you can see, there's a whole lot going on in this book. Johnson is a notoriously difficult writer and it's almost impossible to pin him down. Is he a mystic? Is he a philosopher? Is he a skeptic, a nihilist, a relativist? Is he a theist or an agnostic? Is he maybe all of the above? We should probably look at all of these different interpretations as a conscious effort on the author's part. He wants to collapse the common idea we have of knowledge and what we think that we know. He uses language to, in a weird way, to really go beyond language at the end. The Johnson has, since its composition, become an immensely important and influential piece of literature for um, the entire history of Chinese philosophy and religion. There's a whole ocean of different scholars scholars and people who have written commentaries on it, from uh, Neo-Confucian thinkers to later Taoists and also by many Zen Buddhists, all of whom have taken great inspiration from this very old and ancient text. The Zhuangzi, together with the Tao Te Ching and the Lietzi, serve as the foundational scriptures for all of Taoism and thus by that fact, they are some of the most important pieces of literature in the intellectual history of the world. Even today, Master Dron baffles and inspires us with his very bizarre imagery. Um, even for those of us who don't know Chinese and thus can never fully grasp the wordplay and very creative uses of language that he employs in this book, even in translation, it is a very 
intellectually engaging text in various ways. Anyone who's interested in Taoism or Chinese philosophy or religion or really in the intellectual history of the world generally should not pass on this book. It's really a classic that should not be missed. The words of this wise madman echoes across millennia and still resonates today. And that in itself is testament to the profoundity of the text that he wrote. I'll see you next time.